Welcome to the Why Not Podcast with me, Chrissy Hawkins. In a world where everybody asks you why, I'm here to ask why not. So sit back and relax or walk and listen and join me on this journey as we try to answer this never-ending question. What makes people say why not? Hi guys, welcome back to Why Not. Today I am joined by Helen O'Hanlon. Now, Helen does a lot of different things, so I'm actually going to get her to introduce herself and what she does. But first off, welcome to the podcast, Helen. How are you? Thank you so much, Chrissy, for having me. I am really excited about being on your podcast. I have listened to lots of other episodes, so it's really nice to be invited on. Thank you. Oh, I'm glad you've been listening to them as well. It's great to hear people listening to them. Um, of course. I'm also delighted to have you on as well. Um, so do you want to tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. So my business is Helen O'Hanlon Coaching and there's a few different things that I do under that banner. So I'm a personal development coach and I also work as a horsemanship instructor and I'm also a secondary school teacher by profession originally. So I kind of mishmash all of those things together and uh, work with clients in those areas. Yeah, that's it's really interesting. How did you come into like the personal development coaching yeah, so I suppose it's been a bit of a, a journey. Um, When I finished secondary school, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I went and I did an arts degree in English and geography and did a bit of politics and history as part of the degree as well, just because I, I really enjoyed those subjects. And afterwards, I thought that I might like to do veterinary. And I actually went back and I did the sciences in the Leaving Cert, my first year out after doing my degree. And I got a place to do veterinary medicine abroad, actually. And by the time that rolled around, I had actually decided that that wasn't really what I wanted to do, despite putting all the effort into going back and doing the Lumen search again. Um, I had found in that time a uh, natural horsemanship, and I realized that that was actually really what I wanted to do with horses. Um, and I'd also kind of fallen into doing a little bit of secondary school subbing, and I absolutely loved it. I, I really didn't think that I would. My mother was always saying to me that um, she thought I'd make a nice teacher right in the end. So um. I went and I did my teacher training and have always been yeah like in the summers uh, like studying um, abroad and here in Ireland as well and I suppose just kind of really honing my craft with the horses and then as time went on I suppose with different clients both with the horses and in school that I was working with um, I wanted to kind of upskill and learn a little bit more about like psychology so I went and I did a master's in education and I looked at a lot of educational psychology, motivational theory, working with people, you know, with maybe different additional learning needs in educational settings and really enjoyed doing that. I literally loved every minute of that master's. And then after that, I went and I did another master's in coaching psychology in UCC as well, where I suppose that was quite specific of like working with people one to one and in group situations about, you know, different kind of psychological challenges or issues that might be going on for them or just helping them to maximize their performance and all of the work that I do with horses as well you know psychology is psychology I do um, and even though they're quite mixed into all the different hats that I wear. Yeah, that's that's that was really interesting how you like brought like both of them together have you been like involved with horses your whole life or yeah I have uh, my parents are not horsey at all I do live here in a farm I was reared in a, a dairy farm it's a, a beef farm no but uh, my parents had no interest at all in horses but sure I kept on to them to know could I get a pony and I did and they've been very supportive of me but no they, they wouldn't really have any interest in in horses but yeah like since day dot I've always just been really fascinated by by horses yeah and what brought you to the natural like how did you hear about or came into like the natural horsemanship as well because that's I suppose it's becoming bigger over here I think but it's not really well known I would imagine Mm -hmm. so in 2006 I was working in a racing yard and I had a very bad accident off of a horse had quite a bad fall and ended up with quite serious injuries like I still would have a lot of mobility issues in my my left shoulder and my arm from that accident that I had and then that really led me to getting involved in natural horsemanship my confidence is absolutely at rock bottom in the minus numbers after that happened to me and it was a really slow road of of building myself back up and like you know, I had to sit down and say, God, do you really want a life with horses? And I did. Um, and natural horsemanship that like really helped me to to learn more about the horse, 
to upskill, but also to learn how to trust myself around horses again. And obviously there's, you know, there, there's a lot in that in terms of, you know, maybe learning about the horse in a slightly different way or from a different perspective, but also kind of, you know, managing your own development and, you know, your emotions and your fears and your anxieties in there. But it changed my life with horses and I've met so many fabulous people on that journey. And I suppose I feel in my horsemanship life now, very confident, you know, that I have a very harmonious life with my horses here in the yard at home. Nothing kind of phases me with them. And I suppose when I work with clients as well and go out and give lessons, that's something that, you know, I, I work with people, you know, that they kind of do things on their own and that they can kind of feel supported and in control of their journey. For 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 those I suppose who don't know what natural horseman uh ship is, could you even maybe explain the the theory behind mm-hmm. it? Yeah, of course. So I call myself a horsemanship instructor or natural horsemanship, whichever people prefer to use. So the idea behind the name is that you just understand the nature of the horse and that you understand that the horse is a prey animal and their their safety and keeping themselves alive is the the number one thing for them. Whereas we're predators, you know, we're more direct line thinkers. You know, we traditionally have killed things and eaten them. Um, And, you know, horses know that we're upright, we're on two legs. Um, We tend to do things very directly. Whereas horses kind of come at things in a more roundabout way. So we're just working with the nature of the horse and understanding their perspective. And then, of course, there's, you know, a skill set that goes with it, like maybe, you know, different types of equipment that you might use to help the communication to be clearer. And, you know, even simple things like understanding that the horse has like a long body um, and, that you know, they're a bit like trying to stop an articulated lorry, whereas we're like a little Fiat Punto. We can stop no problem at all. So just even understanding the horse's balance, what is their natural balance like, and then incorporating that into our training. That's really cool. Um, I think that's really interesting. And I think it's good for non-horsey people to hear about that as well, because, you know, mm-hmm. I don't think they understand that a lot of the time that there is actually a relationship between people and their horses, as opposed to they're not just a commodity. Mm hmm. Yeah, um, absolutely and, and it boils back to the relationship you know I often hear people saying oh my daughter is you know 14 or 15 or my son and they spend a lot of time with this horse and they have a very good relationship with them and they can do xyz abc and I can't and you know for any of us that kind of grew up around horses like we spent a lot of time with them you know maybe hanging out in the local stables or wherever you were around horses and you know that relationship of even spending undemanding time with your horse that means a lot to horses that you know every time you're with them something is isn't happening or you know it's not all go 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 of course you can do things with your horse but again that there's just a little bit of a balance of that you don't always expect something from them yeah well that's really really cool um and the mindset coaching was it during your like psychology degree that that kind of ignited an interest in you or was that something you were always kind of interested about especially with your your previous accident and stuff Yeah, I've always been actually interested in that. My mother ran a preschool for 26 years and she was very, I suppose, out there in her thinking, you know, about how children learn and kind of looking to other countries and kind of bringing back best practice here. So she's always been very psychologically minded, as we'd say. So I suppose that kind of rubbed off on me. And um, even when she had the preschool, I actually went and I trained as a high school preschool teacher. That was the curriculum that they used it was really into active learning and again seeing the perspective of whether it was a toddler in the crash or you know it was an older child in the preschool and what I always think of when I'm working with either humans or horses like what does the horse or the human want and how can I kind of maybe shape that up that we're both happy that they get something out of it and you know maybe I get something kind of working my way a little bit too that you know a little toddler kind of eats a little bit of their dinner or you know that the horse might kind of walk onto the walker or in the trailer in a calm or kind of more connected way so yeah I'd say it's kind of down to my mom really um she's actually a psychotherapist as well she's a trauma specialist and she has her own practice and we would work in practice with each other too that sometimes if I have clients that have maybe more complex needs and um, maybe kind of deep-seated traumas and things like that that have come up for them um you know I'll often discuss that with the client and they might go and see my mom for some sessions and she can work on them with things like that so yeah now that I think of it a lot of that is down to my mom I think that's really cool like uh, that you both have that kind of I suppose um passion and interest in psychology and as well you can work together and you can help clients that maybe Mm -hmm. are a little bit stuck maybe you can't do something for them or maybe she can't do something and you can refer them back to each other yeah 
exactly so it works really well um and I love chatting to my mom about things like that we'd often be talking about different approaches and and theories and things like that so um of course like, like I have a lot of formal training in the areas that I work in but um my mom is a great asset to me as well like I said whether it's a two-legged or a four-legged I can often go to her and kind of say look this is what's kind of showing up like what do you think of this so yeah I'm I'm blessed to have her yeah um and so when you kind of decided to start the coaching with um with horse riders and horsey people was that because again like the, do you think that came from the fact that you had the accent you struggled with your confidence for so long or do you think you're just like because you're a horse person maybe I am um, I think because I struggled myself yeah absolutely that I've always had horses like I said at the background so I kind of had to pave my own way in the horse world like that but you're really putting yourself out there you know trying to make a name for yourself trying to be successful and learn as much as you can but I found myself in like dangerous situations a lot of the time and that that really like eroded my confidence over the years and I really wanted to have a life with horses and I have been able to create that for myself and I suppose I feel very passionate about helping other people in that direction too that if you want a life with horses that's absolutely available to you if you have the right support system around you. Yeah. Do you think, um, did you feel like not coming from a horsey background put you as a, at a disadvantage? Um, I suppose I would have thought that initially, yeah, that, you know, I didn't kind of maybe have like a big budget or my parents kind of maybe knowing what a good path would have been or who like good instructors would have been to go to. So I, I did feel at the time that that was a disadvantage. But now when I look back on it, I suppose I can empathize with people who don't come from a horsey background or also I suppose I was kind of able to see things with a fresh set of eyes if you know what I mean of thinking like okay well I don't come from this background and that might be status quo for somebody else but I could kind of I suppose see the wood from the trees sometimes with a few bits and pieces like anyone who comes from kind of the outside to something um but I think that there's a place for all of us in the equestrian world and like I always say, you know, I'm not going to storm around um, badminton. That's not my uh, my niche or going burly at a, a three day event. And I found my niche, which is natural horsemanship and helping people with the whole performance psychology of being around horses. Um, and it took me a while <laughs> to, to find that niche, but I'm really happy with it. And there is a niche out there for everybody who who really wants a life with horses. Yeah, I get you. Did you like I suppose you say now like natural horsemanship is your thing? Obviously, you've done been in the racing yard. You've done a lot. Did you feel at any time that you had to go a certain way with horses and it was a struggle to actually go, actually, no, this is not what I enjoy? Mm -hmm. uh, definitely. And I think when you're younger, it's good to give everything a go. Um, like as you said I would have spent most of my time working in racing yards would have worked in a show jumping yard like I would have been part of the local riding club um, and kind of dipped my toe in the water with lots of things which still stands to me but yeah it definitely um, takes a while to, to find what you're good at and yeah of course I think sometimes naturally if you are doing something a little bit different like what I was of course there can be a little bit of shade cast on that sometimes that you know by you making another choice sometimes people can feel that that's maybe a judge and that's not the case at all we're all here to kind of I suppose you can kind of feel a bit isolated sometimes you can feel a little bit isolated of course if you're doing something a little bit differently yeah yeah I understand do you I suppose as I say like the natural horsemanship isn't so well known over here yet did you find a lot of people going what are you doing when you started that yeah and there's a lot of misconceptions about what natural horsemanship is and a lot of people think it's balls and tarps and all this kind of like funny equipment and it's maybe like trick training as well and of course there might be a ball or a tarp but you if you were certainly studying with me anyway we would be using a very specific reason to develop the horse in some way or to help with something and uh, after the horsemanship clinics with uh, James Robert I did some clinics with him and he'd say lads I don't mind what you're doing but did you have a good reason or you have some kind of structure in your head as to why you're doing this with your horse what is this helping with and he said even if it's the wrong answer I don't care but like have some answer ready for me as to the why of doing things and I suppose I'm very strong on that that when I work with my own horses or other people's horses that I'm helping to develop them physically mentally and emotionally because if you don't develop them in all three areas like that you know your finished product isn't really that solid but that's a very common misconception about natural horsemanship that you know it's all very fluffy and tree huggery and woo woo and all the rest of it and I can promise you I'm a very normal person I think anyway 
<laughs> sign of someone who's not normal. I promise I'm normal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna I'm sure anyone who's who, who plays with horses for fun, we're always a little bit off, aren't we? <laughs> Agreed, definitely. There, there's some little screw loose in all of us, I'd say. Yeah. What do you do for fun? Oh, I argue with a half ton animal. <laughs> Or actually, you talk to them, you speak to them, I argue with them. <laughs> yeah, and I always say to people that, you know, our horses are communicating with us all the time. All behavior is feedback in some way. And it's just our job to kind of decode it and to build up that language with them. And it makes life easier for everybody then. Yeah, no, that's really true. So with the coaching, what kind of, do you have, do you find um you get a lot of similar issues coming through with the coaching? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and people will come to me from all different uh, backgrounds. Like I have some people, they're coming to me just for pure coaching about their life. It could be about, you know, stress management or it could be about some change that's coming up in their life. And then I have the niche of working with people with horses as well. But there will be very common themes that come up in all of those interactions with clients. And a lot of it is like uh, not feeling good enough about yourself you know, feeling that like somebody like myself saying, oh, well, like I'm not from a horsey background and, you know, this is kind of why I don't fit in or ABC reasons and kind of working on that. And, you know, a lot of those things are what I call like cognitive distortions or kind of thinking errors. They might not necessarily be true. Not everything we think is true. So it's basically me asking questions, not from a place of judgment, but being curious and kind of probing around as to, okay, why is this thought in existence? Is there anything to support this you know equally I do a lot of like body work with people somatic coaching of like getting in touch with the bodily part of it because I think in a western culture we sometimes can get a bit preoccupied by the thought element of it and it is very important of course to address that element of it but kind of connecting to yourself connecting to your breath connecting to sensations in the body and what are these telling you um and people find that like to be very successful and an issue like not feeling good enough or imposter syndrome some people call it of kind of coming at that in a myriad of ways and kind of chipping away at it over the course of a couple of sessions but that would be that would be a common one to answer your question that I see yeah and do you find I suppose when people come with you with problems there's generally a different reason behind it um it's not just oh I'm nervous because it's a horse there's always something behind it do you find like they kind of have pushback with you when you try to dig into what that is? Um, I think, of course, that there can be an element of, you know, when we're discussing things, Um, of course, something might come up and might kind of blindside somebody a little bit. But if I'm doing a good job, I should be able to kind of pace that correctly with people, if you know what I mean, that we're just kind of just stretching every little session, kind of chipping away at these things. The other thing as well is if someone has worked with you over the course of a couple of sessions, they've built up a relationship with you um, and that they would know that I'm there for their good um, and to help them to reach their potential and move past these things. So when you build a better relationship with people, that kind of that helps that to dissipate as well. And like I said, it's my job as the coach to kind of pace it that like it's, you know, it's kind of developmentally appropriate for the client um, and the same with our horses, you know, that they should be learning bits and bobs and never even know that they're being trained. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. And so do you have, I suppose, any like certain techniques that you find works often with them? I know you were saying about breath work and stuff like that, that helps maybe them deal with maybe some of the issues that they have or... Mm -hmm. Yeah, there will be lots of different tools that I use. A tool that I often use is transactional analysis or TA for short. And that looks at the different parts that kind of exist within us or the different ego states. So we could have a situation going on with our horse and we might feel a multitude of different ways about that. And the TA model breaks the ego states down into the parent, adult and child. OK, and I. I would know sometimes myself you know when things might get a bit frustrating with my horses and I feel a bit down and out and defeated about things I'm often in a kind of a child place and I might ask myself okay Helen what what age do you feel I'd say oh I kind of feel like seven or eight and a bit hopeless and helpless and that I have no choice to move forward and kind of saying okay could I kind of come back into my adult here now and as a 36 year old that I am at the moment and saying okay things are different now now that you're 36 years of age versus when you were seven years of age, there's a lot more resources available to me. I have a lot more choices. And of course, being nurturing to that child part of me that maybe feels overwhelmed or a bit out of my depth and just saying, you know, that child part doesn't need to worry about it. The, the 36 year old Helen is going to take take care of what's going on. So TA, transactional analysis, that would be one that I use to great effect. And, you know, often if I'm finishing up with clients and you know, we'd be doing a bit of a, a closing session. They'd say, yeah, the TA, that's something that I'm really going to bring with 
me or equally the parent ego state of you know sometimes we can really kind of get after ourselves and kind of you know those kind of I suppose critical voices that come in and again we need all of those parts of ourselves they're absolutely fine we don't want to get rid of them or anything like that but we just want to maybe bring them into balance that's really cool actually them the um asking that like because it's true you do feel very like little I suppose when you can't get something to to work the way you want to yeah. Yeah, and then it might remind you of a time that, like I said, you didn't have much choice available to you or you didn't have those resources available to you. And it, it's just, I find it for myself personally, like it's a really good checker of like, what age do I feel? And, you know, it doesn't always have to be like a really small child. It could be like, oh, I feel when I was kind of 18 or 19 doing the leaving cert and, you know, feeling really overwhelmed by the prospects of what's ahead or something like that. The more tools or the more resources resources we have available to us the greater our capacity becomes and I mean by capacity is capacity for success or stress so more resources and more capacity yeah and yourself now would you normally with your horses and stuff do you go out and compete at all or do you just kind of coach and work with them yeah, so I don't at the moment. I would have done a lot of competing when I was younger. Now, we do have some nice draft horses coming up here at the moment in my yard. So I'd be hoping to particularly one of those. Now we'll do a bit of showing with him in hand next year. So, yeah, it, it takes a while sometimes to kind of, you know, balance everything out in your life. But yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, yeah, competing definitely with my Irish drafts will certainly be in my future again. Yeah. Do you find, um, say, like when people aren't competing, they find like that as a, a reason to say maybe they're not as good as other people or yeah 100 percent. so I, I would totally agree with that Chrissy that I suppose oh, I know that myself even just culturally growing up oh you know someone who is competing and they're doing well of course that's fantastic they're an inspirational character but there can be other people who are inspirational with horses too um and of course like winning is a it's a symptom of somebody's success but nowadays I think I suppose over the last number of years the, the study and the life experiences they've had around horses there's a lot of people who have never in their life gone to a competition and they are amazing horse people people that we could all learn something from um and I suppose one of the things sometimes that I kind of talk to people is about like breaking down the language that we have you know sometimes when we kind of label people they do this or you know they have such an approach that we kind of miss that like we can kind of learn something from everybody and we can of course learn something from people who are competing but like I said there's plenty of people who have never gone into a show ring in their life and they are incredibly gifted and talented people with horses and again it's I suppose about raising our own esteem that we all have something to offer horses and we all have our, our strengths only for us to draw on them. Yeah, I think that's worth reminding people because I think there are a lot of people as well who just enjoy riding and you don't have to feel lesser for not competing. One, uh, one of the things that like we were, obviously you came down when we were recording the Rider Academy and mm-hmm. the girls there, they had like a really like good group. They got really like, they all got really, got to know each other really well kind of thing and became really good friends. And that's something I think that's kind of gone missing from the industry. Would you agree? Yeah, that that collegiality and that camaraderie, that like that's very important. And, you know, I always say like a, a rising tide lifts all boats. Um, you know, when one person is successful, there's a lot of people around them that are going to be successful too. And it's a long road with horses. You know, most of us are at this for years and we'll be at it for years to come. And I think particularly even in a country like Ireland, it's so small. You never know when your paths is going to cross again with somebody. Um, And yeah, I suppose to have a focus on that and to have discussions around it that, you know, anyone who spends any time around me will always hear me saying there's enough, enough success for everyone. Mm. And everybody's success is slightly different. And particularly with horses, like we all know this ourselves that, you know, you might have a really good run with your horse, but then your horse will be unsound and, you know, you're you're trying to figure. So there's highs and lows that we're all going to experience on this journey. And that kind of collegiality and that camaraderie, it just makes life easier. And we all know that, like, you know, when someone kind of does you a good turn, when you're maybe not having such a good day, like it really means a lot. And it's lovely to be able to pass that on to people too. But I definitely think through the grassroots movement and through the Rider Academy, it has really prioritized that. And, you know, it's a lot of really nice networking and meeting like minded people like I met yourself through grassroots. Um, And for me, that's been a really positive element of it that I've met so many nice people and all of us are pulling in the one direction of we want to do a good job with our horses. So, you know, hopefully we can keep this culture and this wave going and everyone will benefit. Yeah, no, I feel the same about it. And 
like personally me I haven't been out on the competing scene for ages so I was just out pottering around but when mm-hmm. I was in it I was in riding club and everything was great and everyone supported each other so it was weird to me hearing people saying how like competitive and kind of I suppose bitchy is the best way of saying it, it's kind of getting and mm-hmm. um, yeah. so it's good to see everyone come together and I think that's another thing with the grassroots movement and Equitas as well. It's done a really good job of bringing everyone together. It doesn't matter what your discipline is. doesn't matter what you do with horses. We want everyone involved. Mm-hmm. I agree. That kind of, I suppose, would you find that kind of division in a lot of the sports is is something, or in even the shows and people who are just riding and stuff like that, do you find that's pro- that could be affecting people's confidence or what would you... Yeah, so I think if there's division or kind of worried about what other people are doing, like that's coming from a place of fear. Um, It's coming from a place of scarcity thinking that there's not enough and that enough can be anything. Success, time, you know, not enough horsepower, not enough money, whatever it is. But, you know, of we all find ourselves in that place from time to time. We're all human at the end of the day when we have that kind of scarcity mindset of just reminding ourselves of that we have an abundance of time there is an abundance of success we all have a niche out there for for ourselves to fill and of course when you're competing you have to compare yourself to other people and my advice around this is to play a game of fact or fiction when you find yourself comparing yourself to somebody else so you might say okay that person won the class and their horse is able to do xyz abc where do i compare factually in terms of my partnership with my horse against the partnership that won the class or came third and you might focus on really specific things oh their turnbacks are really good or that horse is like a really good capacity to lengthen and shorten when needs be okay what are maybe some exercises that I could draw on that I could work on with my horse so that's a factual way of comparing yourself to somebody else where the fiction then is oh well that person has loads of money behind them and you know they're parents bought them a performance pony for however much when they were I don't know seven years of age or they have loads of friends and their friends help them and they don't like me anyway and I'm not getting on well because I'm not talented and I'm not they're all fictions and it's just like boom stop (laughs) yeah and maybe even making note of what are these fictional things that you're telling yourself because like I said earlier not everything you think is true and writing those facts and fictions down on a piece of paper, divide the paper in half and be like, right, these are the factual things that this person that won the class are doing. Where do I line up to that? And what could I do to move closer to it? And then equally of disputing some of those fictional things, you know, and when we kind of talk about other people having more than us or, you know, that they have some sort of privilege more than we do, we're giving away our power. That's coming at it from a very disempowered place. And that's not a place where a lot of kind of growth or kind of an abundant mindset can come from. And that's where when I work with people in coaching, you know, we explicitly sit down and have these conversations because like we've all heard like really good tips and tricks like this on things. But like, you know, how often do we actually sit down and be like, right, for 20 minutes now, I'm going to do this exercise or I'm going to chat to myself about that. And also like we're social beings, you know, we're designed to connect socially. So that's why the coaching kind of works well one to one sometimes that you know, you're chatting to somebody else, you're kind of like answering the questions with them. You're doing these things because, you know, you've paid for this slot for the hour. You want to get the good from it. So it's a very long winded answer now to your question, Chrissy. But yeah, like when you find yourself, you know, that you're kind of looking at other people and you have that kind of scarcity mindset, like, oh, I, I notice now that I'm thinking this way. What can I do to intercept it and bring bring yourself back to a, a power position, a more empowered way of looking at things? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, It is true. Like you do end up doing that, don't you? It's almost like, well, that's that's the reason they're doing it. It's not nothing I can do about that. But there is mm-hmm. often so much more you can do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. There, there's a lot that we can do and to focus on what we are able to do. Um, And like I said, it, it's not an easy thing because when you're competing, you do have to compare. You can't say, oh, you know, don't compare yourself to the other person. OK, but if you want to be competitive, there has to be a little bit of that happening. But like I said, keep it to my strategy of is it a fact or is it a fiction? Yeah. And what kind of advice do you have for someone like who really struggles that would you say kind of maybe go for coaching or maybe just start with that and see if you can identify these things or yeah I mean I'm biased obviously because that's part of my business but coaching is amazing like I go for it myself I have my own supervisor and I know this stuff works but every single week I'm like wow 
does actually really work even though I know that but yeah. I'm blown away by you know like client work or something myself that I kind of stumble upon and be like god I never thought about it that way before that's actually really helpful for me now to know that or to have that in my awareness and when we raise our awareness it gives us more choices and it gives us more options then we can kind of change our behaviors or we can change our mindset or you know like I said earlier about bodily sensation when we're aware then of things going on in the body we can influence those things we can be curious about them and we can create positive change for ourselves and it's not something to be afraid of you know sometimes I think that people think going for coaching oh god it's going to be this big doom and gloom thing talking to your one now for an hour you know and like often like it can be quite fun you know of course I'm not saying it's like fun every second of it there might be kind of some hard realities or thinking god I've thought like that for the last 20 years god you know maybe that has limited some things for me but it's actually like a really uplifting process for most people and as I said there's you know we'd be kind of laughing and joking about things along the way it's not this kind of you know that Freudian image of like lying on the the couch with the psychoanalyst who's very dour looking but that's not really the reality of it yeah I think I, I think I suppose coaching is coming more to the fore now I think maybe before it would have well, my initial maybe interpretation would have been someone basically, you know, those life coach going, yeah, just giving them a load of things. You can do this. And that real American vibe. But it's yeah, true. completely different, really, isn't it? Yeah. And there's an image I often use it if people say to me, you know, what is life coaching? And it's like this ball of wool and the wool is all over the place. It's in a mess. And then beside it, there's like this little reel that's like reeling in all of the strands of wool and it's a bit like that we all have you know thousands millions of thoughts each week and it's just trashing those out and maybe putting a little bit of order on your thoughts at its simplest form that's what coaching is yeah that explains it really well mm-hmm. and like, what is the difference I suppose between say coaching and maybe therapy yeah that's a really good question so coaching is present future focused So how are things showing up for you in the present moment? And of course, like we might talk about the odd few bits from the past, you know, like the past isn't a dirty word either. But if somebody was coming to me and, you know, like they were having, you know, maybe they'd had like a really bad fall or a bad accident and they were having a lot of really strong like flashbacks and, you know, really strong bodily sensations, then that might be when I'd say, you know what, like my mother is like therapist, she's a trauma specialist. This might be something that you could do some specific work because it's a very kind of deep seated trauma if that makes sense whereas like I said coaching is it's present future focused um and again it's looking at things in an empowered way that like and therapy is the same that like you can change your life even if things are not going great for you now you have a huge capacity to change and you also have huge capacity to realize your own potential whatever that may be yeah I love that that actually I really like the way you describe it as bodily sensations you know it's you know I'll, I'll what I'll, do you like about that how does that appeal to you because you know the way people will talk about like anxiety or panic or you know all that kind of different things but it's kind of taking the power away from it it's just it's just a sensation yeah and uh, I just think it's a really good way of wording it because yeah. I think people yeah. could become what they describe isn't it yeah exactly um and in its simplest form you know, if we do feel like anxious or like we feel like that, you know, that we're kind of from the sympathetic nervous system, we're kind of aroused. That basically that's just a motor pattern, even calling it that you have bodily sensations, it's a motor pattern. And like you said, I, I just thought it's interesting you picked up on that because I specifically use those words because, as you said, sometimes it kind of it takes the power out of things. You know, if you kind of call it a different word or kind of a different way of coming at it, that we all have bodily sensations. We all have kind of dominant motor patterns that we use when we think certain. But it, it doesn't mean that we're stuck with them forever. There's a lot that we can do to change those things. And also in coaching, it helps us to recognize the things that are going really well. Mm. things that we really want to hold on to and that we want to keep doing and I think that's important to mention that too you know it's not coming at it from this notion of that you're innately broken or damaged in some way there are loads of things that have got all of us to the present day that are working super and we actually maybe really want to identify those things so that we can continue to do them yeah no that's brilliant um I did notice you were doing that on purpose yeah <laughs> that's what the first was like wait <laughs> very, a minute very astute. no it's good it's good um I think that is pretty much everything I have to ask you, but I do have one question that I ask everybody, okay? And that is, what is the best advice that you've ever been given? 
Yeah. So you actually asked me this question at the grassroots. So I'm going to, I'm going to use the same answer. So yes, um, the best advice that I ever got um, was from my grandmother. And she said, don't hide your light under a bushel. And it's a, it's a biblical reference. Don't ask me now. I'm not great on the, the old Bible. But the idea of it is that you don't want to hide your light under something that the light is not going to illuminate out from. You think of like a light or a candle. You want to put glass around it so that your light can shine. Um, and that's really important because we all have so much success that is just there for the taking. It's there for us to manifest that in our own lives and to reach our potential. And if there are things holding you back, that's okay. There are things that hold all of us back, but there are supports and different ways of looking at things that might help you to, to unleash that success and to kind of live the best version of yourself. And that's something that I remind myself of all the time. You know, if I'm on here, you know, doing a podcast or giving a talk or writing an article of you know, I, I'll be really happy that I did these things. Sometimes it's a bit of a stretch, of course, and it's OK to, you know, to feel a bit like edgy about doing something. But, you know, you, you often hear people saying that they're on their deathbed. They tend to regret the things that they didn't do uh, more so than the things that they did. So, yeah, don't hide your light under a bushel. Yes, I love that. I love that when you said that in the grassroots, I still love it now. It's, just, <laughs> it's so nice. Like, Yeah. Yeah, it's nice. It's a kind of a, a nurturing idea of we all have so much light within us only to, to shine it. Exactly. Yeah. So thank you. I just want to thank you for joining me on the podcast today. One thing I just want to also ask is where can everybody find you if they're interested in coaching, horsemanship? Obviously, schooling is a little bit different, but yeah. <laughs> So thank you very much, Chrissy, for having me on and you're doing a fantastic job with the podcast, talking about all of these things. So well done to you and all the efforts that you put into it. Those things take time and effort. So well done. And people can find me at Helen O'Hanlon Coaching. And that's pretty much all my handles. My website is HelenO'HanlonCoaching.com. So, yep, if anyone would like to, to drop me a line and inquire about any of my services, I would be only delighted to get back to you. Oh, that's amazing and as ever guys you can find me on instagram and tiktok so instagram is strong in the saddle without an underscore tiktok i have sorry is with the underscore tiktok is without the underscore and then i'm www.chrissyhawkins.com is my website so yeah thanks again for joining us today thank you so much chrissy it was fab I really do appreciate everybody who listens to this podcast. So if you please could help me with the algorithm and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And even, you know, if you want to reach out and suggest topics for me, I'd be delighted to hear from you. Drop me a DM on Instagram or TikTok. And thanks again for listening.